Okay, so. And Hare Krishna. Okay, so we are not seeing an echo. All right, so I want you to just review the questions which are there for the closed book because you have to have exam when we finish this course, probably Saturday morning. Yes, Maharaj, you did a review just before this class. Oh, you did a review? You did a review for still, Maharaj. You can, we can, you can, uh, we can barely hear you. Ah, you can barely hear me? Yeah, we can barely hear you. Let me see, where's the volume here? But that Maharaj, is not, voice is not going from there. Oh, it's from here? Yeah, is it better now, Prabhu, for Maharaj? Hare Krishna, can you hear me okay? Sudama so, Prabhu, can you hear Maharaj okay? No response. Hare Krishna. Can everyone hear me? Hare Krishna, I can hear you clearly now. Now, can you hear Maharaj when Maharaj speaks? Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, now it's better. Now it's better. Oh, yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Turn the speaker hmm? off for you so there is no echo. Hmm? Just Here. Yeah. Yes, if we turn it off. Now should be better. Hare Krishna, is it alright? Everything clear? Yes? Sudama? No response. Oh, I got it. I have to also turn it on. The speaker on on my mobile. Yes, Maharaj, now you can speak. Hare Krishna, is it alright? You can hear everything? All right. So I just wanted to check up how much you're get, you're taking in. So we covered text number five, and we heard about the different ways of dealing with a devotee. So how should one deal with the devotee, Kanista Adhikari, who chants the holy name? How are you going to relate to him? Oh my goodness! What is this? The host has. Spotlighted you. Yes, that is fine. Unmute. Don't, don't unmute yourself. Prabhuji, Sudama Prabhu, uh, uh, don't. Uh, I see he's only spotlighting your video, so that is fine. Okay. Yeah, the voice is coming from here. So, so how do you relate to a Kanista Adhikari who chants the holy name? Again, we've got this thing coming up. Can I just oh, put later? Yes, later is fine, Maharaj. Later is fine. Adi Raj Prabhu, can you tell me? You are muted, Prabhu. He is muted. Maharaj is muted. So we have to ask. So Dhamma Prabhu, is everything does sound fine? You are muted, so Dhamma Prabhu. Yes, Prabhuji. Okay, perfect. Maharaj, it is fine. Let me increase the volume. Adi Raj. He is muted. Uh, yes, uh, okay, how do, how do you rel how does the Kanista how do you relate to a Kanista Adhikari who chants the holy name? If we pay respect to him because he's chanting the holy name, alright. How are you going to pay respects? We offer obeisances to him. Well, that's not what it says in the nectar of instruction. You don't know the verse? Verse number five. A devotee who chants the holy name, Kanista Adhikari, we respect him in the mind. In the mind. Okay, Maharaj. We respect him in the mind, right? And then yes. someone's engaged in worshipping the deity, then you offer obeisances to them. Okay. If he's uh, worshipping the deity and initiated, then we offer obeisances to him. Well, if he's worshipping the deity, he should be initiated. Yes, 
He should be twice initiated, spiritually initiated, otherwise he's not qualified really to worship the deity. Right? Yes. And what about the four characteristics of a Majjamad Adhikari? The four characteristics is that he worships, he worships the Lord as an object of love. Yes. And, um, he identifies with the different devotees and respects them in, as such. He makes and friends, makes friends with them. Makes friends with the devotees and uh, he avoids the, in, the ignorant or the envious persons. And he preaches uh, Krishna consciousness. To who? To those who um, are favorable, to those who yeah, to those who are ignorant but who are willing to hear. And he avoids the uh, the envious. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So we'll ask somebody else. Uh, we want to know. What are, what are three symptoms of an Uttama Adhikari? Maybe you know Adiraj, you know three, three symptoms of an Uttama Adhikari? Uh, one symptom is that he sees uh, Krishna within the heart of every living entity. Okay. That's one symptom. Yeah. Another symptom is... Is it that he uh, wants to preach Krishna consciousness? He may. He should have a strong desire to give Krishna consciousness everywhere. We'll ask Archana Bhakti Radha Mataji. Archana Bhakti. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can you tell Hare us Krishna some? Maharaj, can, Maharaj. can you give me some symptoms of Anuttama Adhikari? No, don't look at the book. You should know. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Uh, like he said that uh, an Uttam Adhikari, he, um, uh, he, his faith is very, very strong and he can convince others. Uh, and uh, he, his knowledge is very, very good. Uh, he is very strong that, uh, you know, he can offer uh, um, arguments which are against, um, uh, against uh, devotional service. And he sees uh, the presence of the Lord in every... Um, I, hope, every I, I hope he won't offer arguments against devotional service. I hope not against devotional service, for devotional service, and the certain arguments which are set against devotional service, that he will answer and hence convince others. Okay. Yes. And, uh, and, and, since, uh, and since he sees uh, Lord Krishna in everybody, he feels that everybody is fit. And everybody should be given a chance uh, uh, to, um, uh, you know, uh, to perform devotional service of the Supreme Lord. So he's, he feels everybody is fit. So he's always thinking about trying to spread Krishna consciousness everywhere. Yes, he's trying to spread Krishna consciousness. Okay. Maybe Jita Kroda Prabhu. Jita Kroda, can you tell us another symptom about Uttama Adhikari? No, not ready. Eh? What about Shamasara? Sh Shamasara Jini Mataji. Who has got raised hands? Yeah. All right, Gita Indulekha Mataji, you tell us what are some symptoms of the Uttama Adhikari? Hare Krishna, Dhanmat Pranam Raj. Uh, he's a very highly advanced devotee. And uh, his heart is completely clean, and uh, he is not interested in uh, blasphemy of uh, uh, blaspheming others. And uh, his knowledge is very perfect, and uh, con convinced and convince others. His faith is also strong and unflinching. And he's always thinking of to spread Krishna consciousness, the holy name, okay. and always thinking of Krishna. Does he does he chant the holy name? 
Yes, Maharaj, he stands all in him. He's initiated and he stands all in him. How much does he chant? Attached. He is attached to the holy name. Uttama Zakari is attached to the holy name. Yeah, he's constantly chanting the holy name, right. Okay, so I think we've covered that one. Thank you. Okay, we've got and then text number text number six. They ask, what is the meaning of Nityananda Vamsha? Who would know the meaning? Shamasari Jini Mataji, do you know what's a Nityananda Vamsha? You don't know? Jita, Jita, Krodha Mata, Jita Krodha Prabhu, do you know? Who are the Nityananda Vamsas? Jita Krodha, you don't know. Premadana, Premadana Prabhu. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, uh, the descendants of uh, Nityananda Prabhu who was born in Nityananda's Prabhu's families, family. Yeah. They may have been in just simply from the village of Nityananda. They were just some associates or even servants in the family and they claim they're Nityananda Vamsas. So these kind of people, they claim they have a direct connection to Lord Nityananda by birth, right? Yes. And, yes. And, and what else do they claim then? They claim they're the representative of Lord Nityananda. They claim they're the authorized acharyas because they represent Lord Nityananda, because they're coming in the line from Lord Nityananda. Yes. Is it clear? Yes, and also they uh, claim that they are Nityananda Vamsa Goswami Maharaj. They claim what? As a Goswami from Nityananda Vamsa and criticizing uh, just like uh, our Iskon Goswami like that. If they said uh, American Goswami, something like that. But, well, I don't think that applies to the Nityananda Vamsas. I'm not sure about that. Uh, yes, okay. It may be the Kasko Swamis in Vrindavan. They may say it like that. Okay, then the, the other question is, the spiritual master must not be subjected to advice. From whom? Who should, who should not give advice to the spiritual master? Yes. Uh, the spiritual master should not uh, uh, take advice from his disciple. Right. It's not the yes. business of the disciple to give advice to the spiritual yes. master, or people who are on people on a lower position, less advanced. They shouldn't try to advance the person. They shouldn't try to advise the person who is more advanced. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj Gandavar. Okay, we'll go ahead. We're going to look at... Oh, let's see, number... Alright, so going on to the next lesson, lesson number five, we can see here. Are you all seeing it? Yeah? Right, we covered these things. Three ways to associate with the three categories of devotees. Jita Krodha, do you know the three categories of devotees? No? 
Shankara Das, Prabhu, what are the three categories of devotees? Oh, okay, very good. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. We, stop, we spoke about the importance within this con of maintaining appropriate attitude about the external feature of devotees, right? We don't put a devotee down, you know, Hanuman is a monkey, Garuda is a bird, Gajendra is an elephant, but they're great devotees. And so the same way, someone may be low-born, they may be diseased, they may be handicapped, but they can be a great devotee. Appropriate ways of seeing and relating to an empowered Vaishnava. How should we see an empowered Vaishnava? Shankara Prabhu. Shankara Das. Shankara Prabhu. Yeah? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah? How do we see? How do we see an empowered Vaishnava? How to see him? Kita hendaknya tidak melihat dari fisik beliau. Kita harus berpikir sepenuhnya bahwa beliau adalah penyembah murni yang dikuasai oleh Sri Krishna. Do we get translation or not? I don't hear anything. Seperti seperti halnya kita melihat Sungai Gangga yang terlihat lembung-lembung. Tapi sebenarnya Sungai Gangga tetaplah suci. The, the Holy River Gangga. Prabhuji, can you please repeat the translation again? Sang, uh, Sankara Prabhu said that uh, we we should not see the external appearance or physical appearance of a an, an empowered devotee uh, and uh, uh, the the analogy of uh, the Ganga Holy Ganga River with with foam uh, in in the river, but still it is uh, the Holy Ganga. No, this does not apply to the empowered devotee. Empowered devotee, we should see them as a representative of Krishna. You understand? When you see the empowered Vaishnava, you should understand he is the representative of Krishna. And we should relate to them by offering service and by inquiring from them and being eager to hear from them. Is it clear? Okay, thank you. Okay, going ahead. Here's a quote from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada. As the Kanista Adhikari gradually comes to perceive the mental activities of a devotee and tries seriously to advance to a higher stage, his materialistic conception will go away of their own accord. All right? So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada is saying, Kanista will advance as he gradually sees the devotees in the correct manner. So what does it mean to advance? We were talking, I think we covered this yesterday actually, we spoke about what it means to advance. A devotee is considered superlative or superior according to his attachment and love. What makes it, we were discussing before the Kanista and the Madhyam and the Uttama. 
What, was, what were they based on? What was the difference? How were they classified? According to what? Which particular qualities or characteristics did they have? Which made them Kanista or Majam or Uttama? Gita Indu Leka Maharaji, you can tell me. Okay, very good. On the basis of their faith, knowledge of the scriptures. Yes, yes. And, and also and also maybe chanting. Hmm? Yeah, we spoke about different levels of chanting. So now we're going to speak about diksha, the process of diksha. Process by which a devotee becomes attached to Krishna is described in Ancha Leela. At the time of initiation, when a devotee fully surrenders to the Lord's service, Krishna accepts him to be as good as himself. So that's, it's initiation is not just only the time, you know, the, the one thing, the one time when you sit in the fire yagya. Initiation is an ongoing process, receiving knowledge and being trained by the spiritual teacher. It's not just a one-hour thing. It's an ongoing process, the process of initiation. So it takes some time for us to come to this position. It won't be immediate. By Diksha, one gradually becomes disinterested in material enjoyment, becomes interested in spiritual life. And we spoke about this yesterday. Remember, we spoke about the process of is, uh, in ISKCON of initiation. Because ideally, when we take initiation, we want to take initiation from a Mahabhagavat, from an Uttama Adhikari. So, Diksha is taking initiation, it's like the beginning. Initiation means the beginning. It's not the goal, it's not, some people think because I'm initiated, I'll go back to Godhead. I'm already back to Godhead, now I'm initiated. It's not like that. Initiation is the beginning of our spiritual life. We have to go on, right? We have to come up. We have, to, we have to get rid of all the anarthas and overcome the offenses and come to the stage of bhava. So diksha is complete when we come to bhava. So there, we, we described also the three important parts of the process of initiation taking shelter of the feet of a guru, receiving teachings after initiation, and serving the guru are the principal angas or limbs of bhakti which take us into the door, take us in the door for entering bhakti. Right? So it's, it's not that we're already bhaktas, it's not that we're already devotees, we're trying to become devotees, we're on the path. So this is the process, approach the spiritual master here. We have to accept the pure devotee, the representative, as our guru and offer all respects. One would offer the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the secret of success. For one who adopts this method, the perfect process is revealed. By offering service and surrendering to the spiritual master, one is elevated to devotional service. And by performing devotional service, one gradually becomes attached to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because of this attachment to the Lord, one can understand the Lord. It's from Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 7th Chapter, 29th Verse, Purport. 
Okay? So, then coming back to text number 5, which we covered yesterday, but because it's a very important point, we'll go over it again. It says, one should not become a spiritual master unless he has attained the platform of Uttama Adhikari, a neophyte Vaishnava or a Vaishnava situated on the intermediate platform can also accept disciples, but such disciples must be on the same platform. And it should be understood that they cannot advance very well towards the ultimate goal of, the, of life under his insufficient guidance. Therefore, a disciple should be careful to accept an Uttama Adhikari as a spiritual master. Right? So this is Prabhupada's purport there. We should be very careful about how we, who we accept initiation from. Of course, before we take initiation, there should be a testing period. The disciple should test the guru, guru should test the disciple. Like that. So how do we apply this within ISKCON? We will ask some devotees, how do we apply this principle of initiation? Yes? Who would like to answer? I didn't hear the, the question. The question is, how do we apply this point? Prabhupada is making the point that Uttama Adhikari should be the spiritual master. So how do we apply this in ISKCON? Valmiki? Valmiki Prabhu. Yes, this is Maharaj Hare Krishna. Um, uh, according to my humble knowledge, it is uh, that uh, he's, um, he, he surrenders to uh, one of uh, uh, spiritual masters in our parampara, uh, uh, which is, uh, who are connected to Srila Prabhupada, like uh, disciples of Srila Prabhupada. And uh, uh, Sadhu Shastra Guru, that uh, uh, they must uh, preach. Uh, this uh, this uh, spiritual masters, they must they must preach exactly what Shri Prabhupada wants from us, uh, you know. And uh, we are uh, they, they are teaching also what is in the, in uh, Shri Prabhupada books and like that. This is my understanding. I, I'm not sure, you know. Okay. Anybody else like to re respond to this? Yes? Well, she answered yesterday on this. Advaita Chandra Prabhu. course approach a spiritual master and we uh, convey uh, our our questions our doubts and if we get a convincing answer from the spiritual master then we can uh, feel that this is the 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 the, uh, the, the spiritual master for for us okay. wow I don't know how you learned that in the disciple course. Someone else? What? Dina Vatsal. Dina Vatsal Prabhu? I 
Terangka lagi ya? Okay, this is taking too long. Oh, yeah, he got a glitch. I'm sorry, this is taking too long. We have to hear from somebody else. Yes, Maharaj. Ramesh Prabhu. Ramesh. Can you answer this? How do we apply this principle of but having an Uttama Adhikari as a spiritual master in ISKCON? They are connected to the Guru Parampara Maharaj. And spiritual master also represents the Parampara. So, I'm... I mean, that's okay, but it's just, you didn't say very much, you know, you just say, well, parampara. Prabhupada's books are the basis of our Christian faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
And these three divisions are Kanista, Madhyam and Uttama. Although technically these two classifications speak about different things, Srila Prabhupada, with the exception of the following purport, equates the two in his teaching. Right? So Srila Prabhupada describes here from a devotee is considered superlative or superior according to his attachment and love. You see, we're talking about something a little different here now, attachment and love. Before we were speaking about faith and knowledge of scriptures, now we're speaking about attachment and love. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Thakur has stated that if one has developed faith in Krishna consciousness, he is to be considered an eligible candidate for further advancement in Krishna consciousness. Those who have faith are divided into three, right? Kanista, Madhyam, Uttama. The standard of devotion is also categorized in the same way. A neophyte devotee believes that only love of Krishna or Krishna consciousness is very good, but he may not know the basis of pure Krishna consciousness or how one can become a perfect devotee, right? He's, because he's a neophyte devotee, so he doesn't know so much. Sometimes in the heart of a neophyte there is attraction for karma, jnana or yoga. When he is free and transcendental to mixed devotional activity, he becomes a second-class devotee, a madhyamadikari, right, when he's free from these other things. The devotees are described as positive, comparative and superlative in terms of their love and attachment for Krishna. So love and attachment for Krishna is a little different from what we've been speaking about. We were speaking about, you know, about Kanista, Madhyam and Uttama in terms of their faith and in terms of their knowledge of scripture. But now we're speaking about their love and attachment for Krishna. It's, it's a different thing. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his Bhakti Tattva Viveka, specifies Uttama Adhikari as the requirement for a Madhyama Bhakta to attain the stage of taste and attachment, as summarized in the following table. Right? So he specifies Uttama Adhikari as the requirement for a Madhyama Bhakta. Madhyama Bhakta, we're talking about the devotion. Uttama Adhikari was talking about their faith and knowledge. So here's the table, you can see the table. Different stages on the left side, the devotional stage, beginning with faith and then association, right? Shraddha, Sadhu Sangha, unsteady devotion, Bhajana Kriya, Anartha Nivriti, purifying the bad habits, steady devotion, Nishta, taste, Ruchi, attachment, Asakti, ecstasy, Baba, and love, Prema. And you can see the, the qualifications for these different levels. Right? Kanista, up to purifying the bad habits. And then steady devotion, the Madhyama. And then after that, it's qualification is Uttama. But for advancement, it's Kanista, and then Madhyam, and then Uttama. So qualification is there, but the advancement is a little different. To make advancement, you have to wait till you're up to the uttama, 
to come to the highest level. But the Uttama can be there with qualification and taste. Okay? So Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, to achieve loving devotion, one must have the highest qualification by faith and knowledge. But one who has attained this highest qualification, highest qualification, Uttama Adhikari, has not necessarily attained the highest stage of love and attachment for Krishna, Mahabhagavata. Thus an Uttama Adhikari may still be a conditioned soul at the stage of taste or attachment. Hmm. That's surprising to people to hear this. If you have children there around you, if you have children there, please put off your microphone. So, Dhammaprabhu, can you please uh, mute uh, any anyone who is not, if they are not speaking? Thank you, Prabhu. So, Uttama Adhikari may be a conditioned soul. He may be Uttama Adhikari in terms of faith and knowledge, but he doesn't have the taste or attachment. He hasn't developed the real love for Krishna. So we want, we want you to understand the distinction there. So someone may be Uttama Adhikari, he has strong faith and he has knowledge of scriptures, so he's very fixed in devotional service. But he just hasn't developed the, the real love for Krishna. In other words, Uttama Adhikari is not automatically an Uttama Bhakta. He may simply be an advanced Madhyama Bhakta. <laughs> right? He's Uttama Adhikari in faith and knowledge, but not in devotion. In devotion he may just be at the level of Madhyam. We give an example. A person must have excellent business sense to become a millionaire. But just because a person has business sense doesn't make him a millionaire. And some people, they're very good in business, they, they know how to do business properly, but doesn't mean they make a lot of money. Some people may be very good, they know how to run the business, but they're not very rich, they just don't make money. So it can be like that. But the same way, Somebody knows everything about bhakti, about devotional service. He knows everything, he knows the whole science, but he may not have love of Krishna. Love of Krishna is a very rare thing. It's not easy to get love of Krishna. Krishna doesn't give that very easily. You have to be very special devotee. Where do you get that love of Krishna? Krishna doesn't give it because he becomes controlled. He's, he's very much attached to those pure love, those people who have pure loving devotion. So it's difficult to get pure loving devotion, very rarely achieved. So we have to understand the, these distinctions here. So simply accepting an Uttama Adhikari as a guru is good, but it doesn't mean he's got love of God. Doesn't mean he has to know. Doesn't mean he knows his rasa with Krishna. Doesn't mean, you know, he can be a guru. That's not the qualification for the guru. Qualification of the guru is that he's very loyal to his guru and he's, get, he's connecting us to the disciplic succession. Right? And he's teaching according to his guru. That's very important. We explain a bit more. An Uttama Adhikari may be either a conditioned soul at the stage of taste or attachment, or a fully liberated soul at the stage of ecstasy in love. In either case, Uttama Adhikaris are ideally situated ideally suited to be spiritual masters, 
because they have the highest qualification in terms of faith and knowledge. Thus they cannot be deviated by the arguments of non-devotees, nor barring... Excuse me, Maharaj. Yes? Excuse me, Maharaj. Uh, can, I, can I translate the slide first? Well, I, th I, I, uh, I thought you would be uh, doing leg, that while leg, I... Uh, leg behind. I thought you're supposed to be doing that all the time. I didn't think I have to wait for you to translate the slides. I thought you're supposed to be doing that as we go on. Yes, yes, I'm doing it, but I got uh, a bit left behind because uh, quite fast. Okay, so what do you want me to do? Go back to the previous slide? I think just remain on this. No, Maharaj, I'm at this one. I, I, I finish a little bit more. Okay, so we'll, have, we'll take some questions, give you a chance to translate. Somebody is asking, I want to understand what is the difference between Uttam Adhikari and Uttam Bhakta. So that is what Maharaj has been talking about. Yeah. I think he asked that a while back. Can we answer? Oh, okay. Isn't that uh, his question? Isn't that description of someone on the level of thought? Sorry, this question is not clear. What that is not clear? That was there were two questions. One you already answered. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, I finished, Maharaj. Okay, very good, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay. So we were explaining, you know, it's a, it's a little new, a little different. We haven't heard this much before. You haven't heard it before, but the, the, it's the, the, we have the Uttama Adhikari and the Uttama Bhakta. The Uttama Adhikari is there in terms of faith and knowledge. And the Uttama Bhakta is there in terms of love and, div and attachment to Krishna. So, a subtle uh, di distinction there. Just because you have faith and knowledge doesn't mean that you have pure love for Krishna. Doesn't mean you're on the highest level of love of Krishna. So that's an, an important, this is the point which is being made here. That we have to cultivate also our love for Krishna. The goal of life is to develop love of God. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would say, Prem Punarto Mahan. The goal of life is to develop Krishna Prem. Now, that is different from knowing the scriptures and having faith. We said faith is Shraddha. Shraddha. That simply by serving Krishna we can do everything. That's not love. It's a different thing. Right? So, we, we, we want to understand the process of diksha is develop, to develop this love of God also, as well as faith and knowledge. We also want to develop love. So we make the point here that somebody has faith and knowledge, it's good. They're not going to be deviated by non-devotees. And it will be very unusual if they fall down, because they're so fixed up in faith and knowledge. Right? And we see that if somebody's really strong, really strong faith and good knowledge, they won't go away from Krishna consciousness. Uttama Adhikari Vaishnavas. How to recognize them? They can be recognized by their ability to convert many fallen souls to Krishna consciousness, the primary duty of a spiritual master. Right? How to recognize an empowered devotee? That he should have brought, he will bring many people to Krishna consciousness. Just look at Narada Muni. Look at the people Narada Muni brought to Krishna consciousness. Prahlad Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj, Magrari the hunter, Puranjana, 
so many different people, they, were, they all became devotees by the mercy of Narada Muni. And so, this is the business of the spiritual master, to convert fallen souls to Krishna consciousness, to convince them of the, ur the urgency and the great need of Krishna consciousness. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. And can I ask one question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you if you can if you can kindly tell us about how to uh, develop our love and attachment for Krishna. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Well, we need the mercy of Krishna, just like. How did Mother Yashoda bind up Krishna? How could she bind up Krishna? Mother Yashoda, she got all the ropes and still it wasn't enough. She got so many ropes, she couldn't tie up Krishna. And finally, Krishna agreed to let Mother Yashoda tie him up. So it's like that. You want to develop love of Krishna, you have to have greed. You have to have the very strong desire to achieve love for Krishna. Just like when, when you can cry for Krishna, then you will be coming near to getting that. When you, when you really want it badly, you have to have that very strong, intense desire to get love of Krishna. That is the qualification to develop love for Krishna. The very strong... Thank you very, very much. Right? That, this is called loyam. You know, the, the real, the greed. You're just like you, when we're children, we want something, we want it, we'll cry, we'll cry to get it. So we have to be willing to shed tears to get love of Krishna. Gorgovinda Maharaj used to say he wanted to open a school for crying, to, to educate people in the art of crying for Krishna. Because that is the goal, to develop our love, that we want that Krishna so badly that we will cry, that we are crying, our heart is crying to get Krishna. So this is the mood of the great devotees. This is why they cultivate this, you know, this Raga Bhakti. Okay, we'll go ahead. Thank you very much, Maharaj. I will remember this. Okay. Uh, just a quick note, uh, maybe you can address this in the end. There's actually quite a few questions on the chat box. Later on, maybe when you are done with the class, we can address it. Oh, really? Uh huh. Abhijit Prabhu tells me there are two questions. We looked at them. One question didn't make sense, right? Yes, and the other question Maharaj already answered. And the other question we'd already answered. There are two more. There are two more. <laughs> oh, now there are two more. Okay. All right. So we we'll, we we'll remember that. We'll make a note. Mm -hmm. So a devotee must understand that the Adi Guru. The original spiritual master of the Sampradaya, in other words, Srila Prabhupada, is the Shiksha Guru, and only his teachings are to be accepted, and not those of any other scholar or teacher. And only a saintly devotee who has understood the teachings of the Shiksha Guru is eligible to be a Diksha Guru for others. All right, so we encourage like that within ISKCON. You want to be a guru, you have to take these courses like Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav. You come and study the scriptures and know the teachings of Srila Prabhupada. And then you can go on and become guru. Right, the good students, they become the teachers. That's the process. So this is 
important to remember that how we're faithful and chaste to follow the founder Acharya. The following statement be accepted as ISKCON statement about the founder Acharya, right? How to understand the founder Acharya. To fulfill the previous Acharya's desire for a united worldwide preaching organization to expand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission, Srila Prabhupada founded ISKCON as a distinct branch of Brahma Madhva Gaudiya Sampradaya. Therefore, he is founder Acharya of ISKCON. Srila Prabhupada is the foundational Shiksha Guru for all ISKCON devotees because he has realized and presented the teachings of the previous Acharyas of the Brahma Madhva Sampradaya appropriate for the modern age. Srila Prabhupada's instructions are the essential teaching for every ISKCON devotee. Oh, sorry. Have, your, have our translators, I'll give the translators more time. Okay? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Yeah. So these are important points about how we should understand Srila Prabhupada and why uh, when we, when we, in ISKCON, when we give initiation, the function of the initiation is to connect us closely to Srila Prabhupada. And everyone can have a relationship with Srila Prabhupada. It's not that you have to have seen him. You know, Prabhupada is no longer manifest, he's no longer uh, prakat, he's aprakat. But the opportunity is still there for everyone because Prabhupada lives by his books. So you read his books, you study his books. Uh, I was hearing a quote that uh, somebody asked Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, how can we know you better? He said, you read Krishna, you read that book Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You can know me from that book. Just that one book. Krishna, you can read that book. You all read that book? Very wonderful book, very important book. We can know Srila Prabhupada from that book. And from Srimad Bhagavatam we can know Krishna. The spiritual master reveals Krishna through the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So we're so fortunate. We, have, we are all so fortunate. We have a a relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Not only members of ISKCON, even people outside of ISKCON had relationships with Prabhupada. There were examples. People, somehow, somebody went to the New Vrindavan temple, they were not even a devotee, and somehow they had a dream about Prabhupada, and they brought Prabhupada's slippers, and I can't remember all the details. And there was another lady in the air, airlines, she got prasad from Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Prabhupada's prasada. So Srila Prabhupada's books are the embodiment of his teachings and should be accepted as the standard by all future generations of ISKCON. Srila Prabhupada's worship daily at every ISKCON center by ISKCON members. Every ISKCON spiritual master is responsible to guide his disciples to follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions. Right? We don't, we, we don't say, I'm your guru, you listen to me. No, we follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions. What did Prabhupada say? As founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada gives directions for management, co principles of cooperation, and other practical guidelines, which form the basis and inspiration for ISKCON policies. And Srila Prabhupada established the GBC to execute his will following the order of the previous Acharyas. So all of these points are there to help to remind us the central position in the society of Srila Prabhupada and how we all have a relationship with him. So, quoted in the Nectar of Instruction, text number 5, 
one should not accept a spiritual master without following his instructions. So we, you have to know his instructions. How can you know Prabhupada's instructions? Read his books. Read his books carefully. So very important for us to be reading Prabhupada's books and, and the nice way to read Prabhupada's books is to study them as we're doing. It really helps us to read them deeply and to really try to absorb and understand what Prabhupada is saying. So Prabhupada is describing the, the importance of following instructions here. There's a quote from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila. Chapter 1, text number 60. As one advances in devotional activities, the process becomes progressively clearer and more encouraging. Unless one gets this spiritual encouragement by following the instructions of the, the spiritual master, it is not possible to make advancement. Right? We follow the instruction and we get, we feel, boss, well, this is working, this is good, it, it makes sense. Prabhupada said we should do this, we did it, and it was really good, a good result. And so this way we become encouraged, we want to follow the instructions more. Therefore, once development of a taste for executing these instructions, is a test of one's devotional service. We develop a taste for chanting, develop a taste to wake up earlier in the morning. We develop a taste for prasadam, <laughs> a taste for seeing the deities, very important. Initially, one must develop confidence by hearing the science of devotion from a qualified guru. Then, as he associates with devotees, tries to adopt the means instructed by the Guru in his own life, his misgivings and other obstacles are vanquished by his execution of devotional service. So this is the process. You, you follow the instruction, you become convinced. You see it makes sense, it works. And here's the important, very important verse. The, the one regulative principle over all regulative principles. Right? We just have one regulative principle, not four. This is the one, the most essential order. Smartavyam satatam vishnor vishmatavya najatukrit sarvi vidi nishida shor etayor eva kinkara. Always remember Krishna, never forget him at any time. All the rules and prohibitions mentioned in the Shastra should be the servants of these two principles. Right? This is the most important thing, to remember Krishna. From the Chaitanya Charitamrita, says, Prabhupada writes, there are many regulative principles in the Shastra and in directions given by the Guru. These regulative principles should act as servants of the basic principle. The basic principle is that one should always remember Krishna and never forget him. And then Prabhupada adds, this chanting of 16 rounds is absolutely necessary if one wants to remember Krishna 
and not forget him. Of all the regulated principles, spiritual master's order to chant at least 16 rounds is most essential. Right? Very important. Chant 16 rounds. From text number 5, purport, everyone begins his devotional life from the neophyte stage. Right? From the beginning, we're all Kanista Adhikaris. We begin from the Kanista platform. Gita Induleka was a Kanista Adhikari in the beginning, right? Yeah? And so was I. And even Prabhupada, you could say, maybe when Prabhupada came in the beginning, he was also a Kanista. But if one properly finishes chanting, prescribed number of rounds of Harinam, then he is elevated to the highest platform, Uttama Adhikari. Take some time, just have to practice, keep chanting. When one fully engages in chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, he gradually realizes his own spiritual identity. Unless, unless one faithfully chants Hare Krishna Mantra, Krishna does not reveal himself. Right? You want to understand, you want to know our spiritual identity, you want to know who we are in the spiritual world, you have to chant 16 rounds and you have to chant them without offense and you have to chant them every day. You have to chant with love, you have to chant with feeling from the heart. Gradually, gradually the heart becomes clean and we will see our spiritual form, we will know who we are. But Krishna does not reveal himself unless you chant properly with faith. This is another point from the Bhakti Sandarbha, also quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Simply by offenselessly chanting the holy name of Krishna once, a person is relieved from all the reactions of a sinful life. One can complete the nine processes of devotional service simply by chanting the holy name. Purport Prabhupada writes, out of the nine processes of devotional service, kirtan is very important. The other processes should be executed but they must be preceded and followed by kirtan. So what's more important, shravanam or kirtan? Advaita Chandra. I think shravanam, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, you think shravanam? What do you think, Gita Indulekha? What's more important? Huh? The process that the process started with Shravanam. Actually, we think Shravan, Shravanam, but here it is written. Uh, here you are told that uh, uh, of the nine processes, Kirtan is the very important. Yes. What about Dritatma? Dritatma Prabhu, what's more important, Shravanam or Kirtan? Yeah, you got some hands up? Okay. Who? Okay, Jyoti Radha Mataji, what's more important? Okay. 
All right? Anyway, at least in the beginning, Sravanam is very important because you have to hear in the beginning. Right? You have to hear, first of all. If we don't hear, then we can't chant. We, can't, we cannot do kirtan unless we've heard. So first of all comes Shravan. But kirtan is certainly very important because when the kirtan is done properly, then within the kirtan there is also Shravanam and there is also Smaranam. When kirtan is performed properly with the, with the proper mood and mind control, then within that chanting there is also hearing and there is also remembering. Therefore, kirtan is considered to be very, very powerful, very important. And Prabhupada, of course, he's mentioning here, he said other processes like the deity worship, the classes and so on, should be preceded and followed by kirtan. So we, we always try, when we do programs, especially outside programs, we'll do some kirtan, a little kirtan, a little talk, and then more kirtan. Because the holy name is very powerful. Give people the holy name, let them hear. And that helps them so much to appreciate Krishna consciousness. I saw Prabhupada one time in London, Prabhupada was preaching, this young man came and Prabhupada was preaching to him and the man was arguing. And Prabhupada kept arguing, Prabhupada kept defeating his argument and giving another argument. Still the man would argue, the man kept arguing, he wouldn't admit defeat. Now Prabhupada just preached to him, you know, just to show us how, how to preach. He knew the man wasn't too serious, but Prabhupada kept preaching, giving nice examples because the devotees were all listening and hearing Prabhupada preach. So Prabhupada was speaking for the pleasure of the devotees. So then Prabhupada went off for his morning walk. He went off, the devotees all went with him. But the young man, he stayed at the temple. And when, we, when Prabhupada came back to the temple an hour later, he saw the young man was there in the temple room and he was joining in the kirtan. The kirtan was going on in the temple room and the man was in the temple room dancing and chanting. And Prabhupada noticed and Prabhupada said, see, he said, all my preaching, it didn't help him, it didn't, it didn't make any effect. But the kirtan, that brought him, that changed his heart. He said, so this is Lord Chaitanya's movement, very powerful. You give the holy name, let everybody join the kirtan as soon as possible. Just talking philosophy and so on, it's not so effective. But kirtan, very powerful, can purify the heart for the conditioned souls. Okay, going ahead. Taramaje Sarva Shrestaha. Of the nine processes of devotional service, the most important is to always chant the holy name of the Lord. If one does so, avoiding the ten kinds of offenses, one very easily obtains the most valuable love of Godhead. Chaitanya Charitamrita Anchalila, Chapter 4, Text 71. Right? The most powerful, most important to chant the holy name of the Lord. And one very easily obtains the most valuable love of God. So, we ask, please explain the analogy of Neshines compared to the disease called jaundice? Who can answer this question? Ratan Singha has no chance. Ratan Singha. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So Rupa Goswami explains that uh, how a patient, if uh, he is infected with uh, the disease of jaundice, he cannot properly taste the sweetness. So similarly, a person uh, cannot a taste the sweetness of what? He cannot taste the sweetness of what? A person like uh, who is in jaundice, he cannot taste any kind of sweetness like uh, of sugar cane. So similarly, 
uh, a person inflicted with uh, bhava roga cannot uh, find taste in chanting the holy names what this is bhava roga what are you talking about bhava roga means uh, maharaj that uh, we have forgotten krishna and we are wasting our time in maya is that the analogy maharaj analogy is that uh, uh, like uh, the patient having jaundice cannot taste sweetness similarly the person who is inflicted with uh, this uh, bhavaroga cannot uh, taste the sweetness of the holy names but he keeps on chanting then automatically this bhavaroga will be cured similar to that like if a patient of jaundice he keeps on taking the sugar cane juice in due course of time his uh, disease will be uh, cured and he can taste the sweetness again so similarly we can also taste the sweetness of uh, holy names if we just keep on chanting so when the diseased person takes the sugar candy how does it taste it tastes bitter, bitter maharaj so when the, when the non when the person was this baba rog when he is chanting how does it taste how does the holy name taste it does not find any kind of uh, taste in holy name it uh, seems like this is a uh, very boring process and uh, he does not like chanting at all so what did what did, so you what you say he doesn't like it it doesn't it tastes boring but you still want him to do it how are we Can going you repeat marriage i'm saying that the person you said the person finds it boring and he he doesn't have any taste but you still want him to do it yeah if he keeps on doing then in due course he will be cured but if he leaves then the disease will not be cured and he cannot attend test for chanting so the test for chanting has to come for everyone is it going to come for everyone uh, if if someone is endeavoring sincerely uh, following the instructions of guru then it is surely to come out but for some people it's going to come easy and for some other people it may come take a long time yes for us depending on uh, uh, how intense their sadhana is and how they are endeavoring so why did why do some people not have a taste for the holy name because uh, maharaj they are having so much material desires and uh, attachment for this uh, material enjoyments like krishna says bhogai sariya prasad tanant yaar pari te chete sam bhog satme ka buddhi samato na ke diye so they have a lot of material desires So how how did they get rid of the material desires by chanting more and associating with the devotees uh, so their material desires will be converted into spiritual ones okay so here's the verse very nice verse Shri Krishna Nam Charitadi Sitapya Vidya Vito Patapta Rasanasya Nirochikano Kinva Dharad Anutinam Kalo Saiva Jaspa Svadvikramad Bhavati Tadgadamula Hantri Right. Pastimes of Lord Krishna, the holy name, character, pastimes and activities of Krishna are all transcendentally sweet. like sugar candy although the tongue of one afflicted by the jaundice of abidya cannot taste anything sweet it is wonderful 
Simply by carefully chanting these sweet names every day, a natural relish awakens within his tongue and his disease is gradually destroyed at the root. So Rupa Goswami is describing the power of the holy name. From Prabhupada's purport, again going back to text number 5, if one chants Hare Krishna Maha Mantra offenselessly, carefully avoiding the ten offences, he can certainly be gradually elevated to the point of understanding that there is no difference between the holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself. One should know for certain that without chanting the holy name of the Lord offenselessly, one cannot be a proper candidate for advancement in Krishna consciousness. So very important point. We want to come to that level to know there's no difference between the holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself. That is a stage of bhava, devotional service in ecstasy. So to come to that level, we have to get rid of all the anartas and we have to give up offensive chanting. If we're chanting offense, with offences, then we cannot make advancement in Krishna. And what's the most common offence? Inattention. Inattention while chanting. Chanting without a proper attention. The mind wanders, we're thinking other things. We have to always control the mind. So how to overcome this inattentive chanting? More chanting. Do more chanting. It's the best way to make advancement. How can we chant without offences? I said, more, anybody else would like to say, how can we chant without offences? Any, any, any hands up? Yeah, who would like to volunteer? Dhritatma Prabhu, how can we chant without offences? Dengan cara fokus kepada nama suci Tuhan, mendengarkan nama uh, Krishna, uh, kemudian uh, focus on the holy names, uh, listening to the chanting of the holy names. Listening to the chanting of the holy name, okay. Uh, poinnya adalah fokus mendengarkan nama suci Krishna dengan penuh perhatian. So, to, to focus uh, listening to the of the holy name uh, with full, uh, attention, full attention. Mm -hmm. So you have to chant loud, right? Loud chanting will be helpful to give more attention. When we chant aloud, they can hear. if we chant in the mind, difficult to control. Okay. So the anartas, they cover the holy name. That's the problem. Just like clouds cover the sun, so the same way the anartas cover the sun of the holy name. So only a portion of the effect of the name is there. We have to overcome the anartas. So serious student takes shelter of a guru, bona fide guru, by force of his effective spiritual practices. He can remove the obstructions blocking the son of the holy name. And then when the clouds and the mist go away, the son of the name becomes visible and gives devotion, the treasure of love of God. Hmm? So the Guru helps to remove the obstructions, taking the, the association of the Guru, the guidance of the Guru, 
Remember we showed this diagram in the beginning, at the bottom the Duratma and at the top we have the Mahatmas. The left side is Bahiranga Shakti and the right side is Antaranga Shakti. The bottom, the urges, uncontrolled urges causing us to do unfavourable activities and putting us in the mode of passion and ignorance. But as you come up, we perform the six favourable activities and we avoid the unfavourable activities and the urges are controlled, then we become to the, we come to the mode of goodness, we become Mahatmas. So we say, you have to come up, you have to promote ourselves to the mode platform of goodness, sattva gun, by following the instructions of Rupa Goswami and then everything about how to make future progress will be revealed. So we are Rupa Nugas, we are following Rupa Goswami. So to improve our chanting, we have to get rid of the four causes of unwanted habits. The four causes of the unwanted habits, first of all offences, then material desires, then weakness of the heart, and finally the ignorance of spiritual truth. Right? These are the four different kinds of anarthas which we want to get rid of so we can chant the holy name nicely. Bhakti is Klesh Agni, produces Anartha Nevriti. So perseverance in Bhakti, along with avoiding the unfavourable and following the favourable, will help to destroy Anarthas. You can see Rupa Goswami has given us good instruction how to destroy, get rid of the anarthas. We follow his teachings here. Transcendental knowledge by studying Shastra, hearing from advanced devotees overcomes ignorance of spiritual truth. You can see everything in our Krishna conscious program, if we follow it, it will help us to get rid of the anarthas. Hearing from the advanced devotees will get rid of our ignorance. There's a table here to show the stages of removing the anarthas. Right? You can see we get rid of the offences at different levels. At the stage of nishta, it's complete. But then above nishta is ruchi, and then it's absolute. Devotion is absolute. somebody is doing just sinful or pious activities, then it's different. 
he gets rid of it at the stage of asakti. And somebody is an offensive chanter, when he gets shelter at the lotus feet, then it's absolute. So different stages to remove the anarthas. So I was I was saying, huh? I was saying about inattention in chanting. This is the quote from Hari Nam Chintamani. Pramada, madness, meaning is inattention or carelessness. And from this offence, all other offences spring. So we must try to chant with proper care and attention, controlling the senses, avoiding bad association, taking good association, very important for being attentive. You see, the nectar of instruction gives us so much important knowledge right in the first three, four verses to help us to get rid of all the anartas, all the bad things in our chanting. So the inattentiveness is described in three different ways. Apathy, inactivity and distraction. Apathy means you couldn't care less, you don't think it's very important. Inactivity, you don't do anything, you don't want to do it at all. And distraction, you know, you're, you've got your mobile phone, you've got your television, you've got some other things, you're watching other people, like that. So three types of inattention. So until one gets free from these three types of inattention, we cannot perform devotional service at all. Even if one gives up all other nama parats, he's still inattentive. If he's still inattentive, he can never have attraction for the holy name. <laughs> If one has enthusiasm in the beginning of devotional service and that enthusiasm does not become cold, then one will never become apathetic, lazy or distracted in chanting the holy name. That's the challenge. We have to keep our enthusiasm. People often have enthusiasm in the beginning, but they become cold they lose it. So it's important to keep our enthusiasm, don't lose it. We should try to even to increase our enthusiasm, become more enthusiastic as we go on. And Prabhupada gave this advice about chanting. He said, just like crying for a child crying for his mother, we should chant like that when we're calling the Lord's name. We are the child and we're calling for our guardian, our parent. And so Prabhupada translates the Maha Mantra like this, O my Lord, O energy of the Lord, please engage me in your service. Srila Prabhupada said, practice makes perfect even in spiritual life. So the more we practice chanting, the more we become perfect in chanting. And he said of himself, probably to encourage us, that it took him 30 years to be able to chant the way he was chanting when we met him. So we should be patient also, but determined and enthusiastic. Have you been chanting for 30 years yet? Even we may chant 300 years, we may not get to be like Prabhupada. There's no guarantee. It's not just chant 30 years. <laughs> we have to really want, we have to be determined, enthusiastic, very important. So advancing to go on, by devotional service, 
one is elevated to the transcendental planet Goloka Vrindavan. And there also there is only devotional service. The activities of devotional service in this world and in the spiritual world are one and the same. Devotional service does not change. The example of a mango can be given here. If one gets an unripe mango, it's still a mango. And when it is ripe, it remains the same mango. But it has become more, it's become more sweet, more ripe. <laughs> right? uh, it's become more, more sweet. We lost that. And so in conclusion, Yashya Devi para bhaktir yata devi tataguro tashyaiti katitahyata prakashanti mahatmana. Unto those great souls who have implicit faith in both the Lord and the spiritual master, all the imports of Vedic knowledge are automatically revealed. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. All right, so now we'll come and take some questions. Yes, let's have the questions. So someone is asking, which mode is better? Is to chant the holy name even if I don't get a taste? Because I enjoy it. To chant the holy name because I enjoy it. Oh, I'm chanting the holy name because I enjoy it? And the second is, even if I don't get a taste, chant because Krishna will be pleased. But on the other hand, I may chant the holy name even I don't enjoy it, I don't have taste, but because Krishna wants me to chant. So which is better? Well, it's certainly better you chant the holy name because you like to chant the holy name. You should want take pleasure in chanting the holy name. That's certainly preferred. You chant the holy name because Krishna wants you to do it. You may chant grudgingly. The mood of devotion will not be there. It will be mechanical chanting. But if you chant because you like the Holy Name, because you take pleasure, then your chanting will have more feeling, more love, more, it will be more connected to Krishna. Some appreciation for the Holy Name and calling to Krishna. But if you're just simply chanting out of obedience, it won't have the same mood. So it's better you chant with pleasure that, that you take, you have a taste, you like to chant. Uh-huh. The next question, is Uttama Bhakta equal to Prema Bhakta or are they different? The next question, is Uttama Bhakta, being an Uttama Bhakta, is it equal to Prema Bhakta or are they different? No, they're not different. Uttama Bhakta means also Prema Bhakta. And the last question is Mahabhagavat comes to Madhyam level for preaching, which is considered to be the best service to God. So, how can he be considered to be a Madhyam devotee because he is doing the greatest service? Also, when Mahabhagavat starts preaching, his faith and knowledge does not decrease. So how can he be considered a Madhyam Adhikari? When a Mahabhagavat starts preaching, his he faith... Comes, he comes to the Madhyam level, mm -hmm. but his faith and knowledge remain the same. Uh -huh. So how is he considered to be a Madhyam Adhikari? Uh -huh. 
All right. So the Lord is asking this question that someone's on the platform of Uttama Adhikari, right? But he's going for preaching. And so how is it he's considered a Madhyam Adhikari? Because his faith and knowledge will still be the same. He's Uttama Adhikari, he's got the best, the strongest faith and the most complete knowledge, but he comes down to the Madhyama platform to go for preaching. So he's not a, he's not a Madhyama Adhikari, he's an Uttama Adhikari because he brought his faith and knowledge with him. Yes, it's true, but the point is that the Uttama Adhikari, usually his business is not to preach. Someone's an Uttama Adhikari, the, their business is just to chant the holy name. They will just do their bhajan, their bhajan anandis. They're not Gostavanandis. Gostavanandis is a preacher, but their bhajan anandis on the topmost platform, they simply chant. They simply take pleasure in chanting the holy name. They don't do anything. They don't go anywhere for preaching. They're not going out to meet the people. They're simply staying in the holy dham usually in the Holy Dham and they're chanting the Holy Name. That is the business of the Uttama, that's how Uttama Adhikari would be uh, active. They simply sit and chant. Now there was one devotee, Prabhupada, told him his job business was just to sit and chant. He was a Babaji. Prabhupada had given him Babaji initiation. He said, your business is just to chant. You just sit and chant. He had some disease, at least they thought he had some disease and he was dying. And so Prabhupada said, okay, you sit here and you chant. <laughs> After some time he found out he didn't have the disease, he wasn't going to die, so he gave up chanting <laughs> and went off back into Maya. But anyway, the point is, on the topmost platform, Uttama, he won't preach. But it's coming down to the, it's going for preaching, so he's becoming a Madhyam. Of course, he has a strong faith and knowledge. He brought his faith and knowledge with him. But he's, he's doing the activity of the Madhyam. And as the Madhyam also, he's making distinction. It's, it's giving Krishna consciousness to the, to, the, to, the, to the ignorant. And he's avoiding the atheists and the blasphemers. He makes distinction. That's the Madhyama platform. When you make distinction, the Uttama on the topmost platform, it doesn't make any distinction. There are some uh, hand, I think, in question from the devotee that there is hand. Okay. A question there is Sadananda Prabhu. Yes. Does he have a question? Sadananda Prabhu, you have, you have your hand up? You have a question or a comment? Sadananda Prabhu. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I had raised my hand for the previous thing. I forgot to put it down. <clears throat> okay, Dinavatsar Prabhu just raised his hand. Dinavatsar Prabhu just put his hand up. You have something? A comment or a question? How do we uh, develop or increase our faith in chanting the holy name? Because uh, because the, this faith sometimes it increases or our enthusiasm sometimes sometimes increases, but sometimes it then uh, like decreases like that. So how do we uh, get fixed in our enthusiasm in and our faith in chanting the holy name? We get fixed in our chanting of the holy name by faith, by faithfully, regularly, offenselessly chanting the holy name. When you regularly chant, you make it a daily program every morning that you get your you get up early and you go and you chant and you chant sixteen rounds at least. That's how you get your faith. You get the taste by the chanting. 
Just like we were quoting that verse about the man with jaundice. He couldn't taste the sweetness in the beginning, but he kept drinking it, gradually it became sweet. The same way the chanting of the holy name. You, you, we don't taste it because our jaundice, because we have materialism, the jaundice of materialism covering our consciousness. But the more we chant and associate with the Holy Name, then the more we will taste the sweetness of the Holy Name. We want to experience, we want to develop that faith in the Holy Name. It comes. You have to do that. Follow the process. As you follow the process, you will see, you will feel it working. That as we go on in Krishna consciousness, we lose our interest in material sense gratification. The thoughts of material activities becomes disgusting to us. We just have no attraction anymore for enjoying the material world. The thoughts go away because we're so busy in Krishna consciousness. We don't even think about other things. So that faith comes just by following the process. Just keep ourselves always busy in Krishna service and naturally the taste awakens. We said love of Krishna is in everyone's heart. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prem Shadya Kabu Nai. Right? We have to hear about Krishna. You hear regularly the love for Krishna awakens. And the first part of the question? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Gita Indo Lake Maharaji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Like we are given for this five analogies. And uh, what uh, they, all the others have, I can understand the slope, but I can't understand the shloka of the a newly married girl naturally expects offerings. Is there a shloka also connected with that? Like the other analogy, analogies have a shloka. In the Shastras, they all have shlokas, but this one I can't understand. Is there any shloka also? I don't. Of this analogy? I, I never had any shloka, but Prabhupada gives an example yeah. of, of, in relation to enthusiasm and confidence. Yes. In describing enthusiasm and confidence, Prabhupada gives that example. But I don't know any sloka about okay. it. Okay. And Maharaj, in related to this, the uh, the line given in the last is, uh, please explain in detail about the confidence related to this analogy also. I'm, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Please explain in detail, Maharaj, the analog this analogy in related to confidence. Like I have understood the analogy, but in it said in devotional service surrenders means one has to become confident. So in relation to this analogy, uh, confidence, please explain. Well, confidence in the sense that the wife has confidence in her husband, that her husband can impregnate her and that she can conceive a child. Right? She has to have confidence like that. And she puts her trust in the husband, that the husband can, trans can transfer a child into the womb of his wife. So that confidence is there. She's ready to surrender to the husband and to accept the husband so that she can carry his child and develop his child in her womb. So she has confidence. No, she married the man, she has confidence in him, that he can, that he's trustworthy, that he's a good man, he'll make a good father, he'll give her a good child. That's how I understand it. All right, any other questions? Bankim Govinda Prabhu. Yes, 
association very important? Yeah, so how do we understand Bharat? I mean, we are, I'm hearing some lectures where they say night. Chanting is one hundred percent of Majanda. It's one hundred percent. Ninety-nine 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 percent. Nin
to study and relish Prabhupada's books. Prabhupada was asked, is it enough just to read the books? Prabhupada said, more important than reading the books is discussing the books and explaining them to others. So, if you're going to do that, it's very good. In the absence of your spiritual master, you can take up the mission of your spiritual master and preach Krishna consciousness. And you can get people together and study Prabhupada's books together and discuss them and explain them to each other. That is a very good activity. That is a very good use of your time. If you do like that, then, all right, very nice. But, you know, when we read Prabhupada's books, I don't know, but I, I get more questions as I read Prabhupada's books than I ever had when I was a new devotee. When I read the books in the beginning, I thought I understood everything. But now the more I read, the more I realize there's so many things I don't understand. And it's very nice to have other devotees to be able to discuss the points which you have questions about. You know, you read the books, you should have questions. It's not that it's so you can understand everything. You will read the books naturally. There will be some questions you'll want to understand, you'll want to know what, what is actually the meaning. And so that's why you need association. That's why it's good to have association with other devotees, that they can help us to answer the different questions which we have, which come up as we read the books. Or you're preaching with people, you may be discussing with, they may have questions, they may raise points you cannot answer. And it's good to hear from other people. So association is always recommended. Yes? Uh, next question. Maybe we, we are over time a little bit, but we also started the Q&A. Yeah. We have Advait Chandra Prabhu. He has, he has a question, I believe. Advait Chandra has a question. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, I'm sorry, I have... Uh, I just want to confirm about uh, how can we chant uh, without uh, offense. I, I have an uh, answer. Is this correct or not? Please, uh, Maharaj, check. Uh, so, based on the Sikshastaka, uh, if we chant the holy name with the proper mood, with humble mood, and uh, we are ready to uh, give respect to everyone, and we do not uh, talk to everyone, uh, give respect to us. Uh, so, based on that, uh, uh, we can chant uh, without offense. Is that correct or not, Maharaj? Yeah. Yes, Lord Chaitanya says like that in the Shikshastika. He said we should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, offer our, and, and, and offer our respects to others and not be eager for respect for ourselves. Right? One should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than a straw in the street devoid of all sense of false prestige and ready to offer all respects to others. In such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. So if you can chant in that mood, very good. Yes, you chant, means you can chant constantly, you can chant more incessantly. Very nice. The ego should be like the ego of our soul, about the size of our soul. Our soul is one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. So our spiritual dimension is very small. So our ego should also be very small. Our ego should not be big. You know, you may be a big tall man, but don't make your ego big. Keep the ego small. Be simple. Don't... Don't create problems. Just be humble, offer respects to others, and chant the holy name. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. We have Ananta Vijay Prabhu. Ananta Vijay Prabhu has a question. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes, I, I have one question. The just Maharaj tell us that Heaven uh, Prabhu in the beginning, my Kanishta, and gradually promote to the stage of Uttama by process. But in, in the other hand that I heard one class that there are two type of soul, one is Nitya Vada and another is Nitya Siddha. That, uh, the, in that class that Prabhupada was uh, uh, included uh, in Nitya Siddha Jiva Mahara. What is uh, the I a little bit confused. All right. I'm sorry, Mahara. So Nitya Siddha, Nitya Siddha means they attempt the liberated souls in the spiritual world. Right? They've, they've already gone back to Godhead. They're in the spiritual world. They have spiritual bodies. So they're Nitya Siddha, they're perfect. Siddha means perfect. We're sadhakas, we're not perfect. We're doing sad sadhaka to become perfect, to become Siddha. But the Siddha, he's perfect. He's the liberated soul and he's living in the spiritual world. And the Nitya Bada is the conditioned soul. We're eternally conditioned souls. Eternal in the sense that we've been here a long time. But we can, we can change. The, the conditioned soul can become a liberated soul. The Nitya Bada soul can become a Nitya Siddha soul by, by, do, by devotion, by hearing and chanting and cultivating devotion for Krishna, by the blessings of the devotees. The Nitya Bada can become Nitya Siddha. So it's different, yes? Can you understand the Nitya Siddha, Nitya Bada? It's not related to Kanista Madhyamanutama. Yes, But Prabhupada is a Nitya Siddha. Yeah. Prabhupada's Nitya Siddha, yes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mahara. Yes? Ananta Pandit Prabhu. Ananta Pandit Prabhu. I have question. Maharaj, I'll be up on the So you mentioned earlier uh, 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 you could uh, Maharaj saying that he, uh, it is called it's a school uh, where we learn to cry to cry for the love for Krishna uh, in, in another uh, in another like uh, verse uh, we we know like Susukam Kartum Avyayam that this devotional service is uh, done in, in happiness, like uh, in uh, and that, uh, like Shri Prabhupada said, chant and be happy. So we, so many things like we have festivals and everything. So, uh, how is the context between the uh, uh, the the crying here and the the other sense that we uh, we do this devotional service in bliss? Yes, we have to understand the crying that this. This crying is ecstasy. 
tears of ecstasy. Just like when the devotee feels the separation from Krishna, it's ecstasy, it's not material, it's spiritual. The crying, you see, you're thinking of the crying in some material way. The material world when we cry, we cry because, you know, something unpleasant happened to us. But this crying of, in the spirit, the crying of the devotee is spiritual. That we're crying uh, due to love of Krishna. Because of the intense feelings for Krishna, the feelings of love for Krishna are so intense, they're bringing tears to the eyes. Is it all right? Can you understand? And you can read, and you know, in Shikshastikam it's described, Almighty oh, Lord, when will my eyes be decorated with tears of love? flowing constantly when I chant the Holy Name. So when we chant the Holy Name, the tears of love, when, when, like, you know, this, this, is, this, this is the stage of ecstasy, really, where tears are coming from the eyes because of the very strong desire, the eagerness to be with Krishna, or to meet with Krishna, the devotee has that strong feeling, oh, when, when is Krishna coming? When will I be with Krishna? Longing, ardent longing. The devotee was, the Upendra, Prabhupada's servant was speaking one time, just after Prabhupada left the world, and uh, he was describing how Prabhupada asked him, what do you think of the chant? What do you think? We were playing Prabhupada's recording of Kirtan, and, Prabhupada asked Upendra, what do you think? And Upendra said, I, he said, I think it's a very longing. There's a lot of longing there in Prabhupada's singing. And Prabhupada liked that. He said, yes, that's right, longing. Longing for Krishna, to be with Krishna, and feeling the separation from Krishna, thinking, when will Krishna come? So that separation, that is ecstasy. That is not material. That is spiritual ecstasy. What appears to be material suffering is the highest ecstasy on the spiritual world, on the spiritual plane. Is it clear? You can understand? Yes, sir. Yeah, you're right. The devotional service is joyful. And that feeling of separation from Krishna, that is also, you know, that is also, that is the highest ecstasy. The devotee feels so much love for Krishna, absorption in Krishna. Because we are conditioned souls, because we are Nitya Bada, it's difficult for us to appreciate. So we, you were saying, you know, Prabhupada's Nitya Siddha. Yeah, Nitya Siddha. <laughs> but he's coming to the material world, right? He's coming into the material world. Usually the Nitya Siddhas, you know, a few like Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, Raghunath Goswami, they were Nitya Siddhas. They come from the spiritual world. They come to take part in the pastimes of the Lord. But while they're here in the material world, you know, they're playing the part like they're Nityavada. Very clear, Mahara. Thank you, Mahara. All right, we'll stop here now. It's getting late. Thank you for all your questions. And we'll continue tomorrow night. Please look over text number... Eight. Huh? Eight. Look over text number Thank eight. Thank you, Okay, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Thank you, Thank you, Maharaj. Very nice lecture. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Any dots here? Is it? Zoom is here, it's ended, my Is it? Okay.